King and Assassins, this is a two-player competitive game of asymmetrical bluffing and maneuvering. One player controls the king and the knights that are in charge of protecting the king, and the other player controls citizens that are sympathetic to the assassins because three assassins are hiding among them, and the citizens will try to protect them, to allow the assassins to sneak next to the king, and then, well, to stab the king. The board, here you see the board in its entirety, it is double-sided, the other side works slightly differently for more variety in gameplay. The general idea is that the king, and on this side it starts here, is trying to enter the palace from one of those two gates there. The king wins by entering the palace or by capturing all three assassins. The assassins player wins if the game is over when this deck is completely exhausted, and we'll see what that means in a second. If the game is over and the king is not in the palace yet, the assassin's player wins. The player also wins if the king is stabbed twice. The first time that the king is stabbed, you replace that base with this one, and the second time, when this one is on, that the king is stabbed. The king is dead, long live the king, but not that one specifically, and the assassins win. So. You position the um, game pieces on the board according to instructions and symbols printed on the board itself. I must point something out. These miniatures representing the citizens are unique miniatures. Each is different, which is really cool, but also, oh, come on, but also very important for gameplay purposes because you need to make sure that you know which one is which. Before the game begins, after all citizens have been placed on the board, the player controlling the assassins takes this deck of cards and selects three of them to be the actual assassins. And so that's why, again, you need to be able to identify them visually and easily. Yeah, don't tell my daughters, but my assassin, well, at least one of them is always the guy with the pitchfork because I can't tell him. Uh, different easily from the others and you know if you like to paint miniatures then you could also paint them according to this color scheme that will make the game even more playable and um, as is as is this miniatures are distinctive enough that you can definitely play the game so by selecting these three cards now the assassins player knows who the assassins are but the king doesn't then we have this deck of cards here this is the deck of event cards action point cards call it whatever you like what happens is that each turn you flip one of them face up and that will tell you it will tell you how many action points the king has how many action points the knights have and how many action points the assassins have that's simple. Then the king player will spend action points uh, performing actions with their game pieces and then the assassin player goes. There is an action which is uh, uh, imprisoning the citizens that is available only in some turns which is the turns indicated by that symbol. What are the actions available? Well, there's this very, very good player right here, double-sided, and two com. That's such a nice touch. And not many games realize that with two players, you need two player rates. So, if you're the king, the king doesn't do much. The king just spends one action point to move to an adjacent space if the adjacent space is empty. What is also nice is you can spend your action points in any order. So, as the king player, one, two... Uh, that's two points from the allowance of the knights, then one for the king. I still have three action points for the knights, and I do that, for example. So they can be spent in any order. You can move a miniature, then another one, and so on and so forth. So the king doesn't move much. The knights, for one action point, they also move next, uh, they move into an empty space, or they can move in a space containing a citizen, in which case they simply push them to the next logical space. We have roofs. You can jump out of, uh, of them, you can climb them. So if a knight is on a roof, it still costs one action point to move from roof space to roof space, but it costs two action points to climb on top of a roof and one action point to jump down. 
Uh, then when that symbol that I showed you is is visible, that one there, the action, the option of capturing a citizen is only is also available. Then simply the uh, player, the king player, can spend an action point to remove a citizen that is adjacent to a knight. You can do that once per turn, otherwise that would be too powerful. Also, once a citizen has been revealed as an assassin, then you can spend an action point to have a knight adjacent to the assassin, eliminate the assassin. So those are pretty brittle. Once you reveal them, chances are they'll go down easily and fast. That's for our king player. As for the assassins, uh, the movement, the action points are well, citizens and citizens revealed as assassins. They have slightly different uh, actions or different uh, uh, expenditures of points. Also, to reveal a citizen as an assassin, replacing the miniature is a free action, causes zero action points. The citizen move pretty much like the knights, uh, one action point. Uh, from from space to space on the street or on the roof, two to climb and one to climb a roof and one to jump down. The assassins still move uh, same expenditure when they're the same level, but they can climb much faster for only one action point, and they can jump down for free. This is super important because when an assassin is on the roof, they can use with this one being free, they can move further and faster than one would imagine. Two action points. To deal a one to the king if you are adjacent to the king eliminating a knight the assassins can also eliminate knights the first knight that you eliminate in a turn costs one action point the second one if you have enough action points costs two and this is the general idea players will keep alternating card after card resolving their activations the king first the assassins next uh, sometimes citizens get arrested if a citizen that is an assassin is arrested when still, un, when still unfound, when still unrevealed. The assassin player must not reveal that to the king. So when you arrest the citizens, you don't know if you're arrested an assassin or not. The only time when you reveal that is if the last assassin on the board has been captured. Then the assassin player just lost the game and they need to declare that. But the fact that uh, as arresting citizens uh, does not ensure the uh, king player that they removed an assassin and they don't know exactly how many assassins are left out there. That is an important element of the game. So continue like this, turn after turn, until one of the players meets the victory conditions. Again, for the king, capturing all assassins or reaching the palace. For the assassins, keeping the king in the, street, uh, in the streets until the end of this deck or eliminating the king. King and Assassins. I like it enough. I don't love it, but it's an entertaining game. I would say my daughters like it more than I do, and so that, that already has value, then I'm happy to play with them, because it doesn't take long to set up. It's not complicated. Um, it's entertaining. It's entertaining. Uh, maybe what prevents me from like, whoa, is that there is a bluffing element, there's a tactical element, all things that I like, um, but they feel somewhat dry so much about really counting exactly how many squares are from here to there and uh, there is just an element of planning that the entire idea seems to be about the adventure and the intrigue and stabbing in the dark but there's just something cold and geometrical and mathematical about it that that you have in every game but in many games that is sort of like hidden it's there at the core but you don't think about it, you experience the story and the theme. And here yet sometimes the theme seems to be held back by the mechanical and by the dry cold elements of the design. I have to say the game seems to be uh, pretty balanced. Uh, most games that we, that we played were actually incredibly close. Uh, to the point of the king being stabbed right before entering the, the palace or being stabbed when only one assassin was left alive. Um, so actually, it's well balanced the way, but yet there's something just a little bit cold about it um, that, I don't know, just prevents me from saying that this game is not just... 
it's good, but it's you know, super good. It's good enough, and maybe maybe that's it. Maybe we're just so spoiled by excellent games that come out every day that now a good game uh, had to point out, oh, it's only good. It's a good game. Uh, the production is pretty good. Uh, those statues, those miniatures, I think it's pretty impressive that you're able to tell most of the details, most of what they are. Most of the times, the art is also very good, the board looks good, production-wise, it, it's fine. The mechanics, again, is nice to have uh, a completely non-symmetrical gameplay, and as you can imagine, it's just more fun to play with the assassins. That's just that's the way it is. As the king, you're trying to figure out uh, uh, the bluff of the opponent, but you can bluff. There's nothing that you're doing that is subtle there. There's no reason in putting a knight really far from where it makes sense, because then you'll do something with it because you won't, you won't be able to, but there may be advantages as the assassins to put your assassin in an area that looks really stupid. Why would the assassin never be there? The king thinks that, and so uh, the king falls into the trap. It's just, there are bluffing games in which both players are bluffing. There's a bluffing game with a bluffing element in which really only one player has reasons to bluff, and that's the assassins. The other player is trying to figure that out, but being the bluffer is just more fun. And I have to say, there was this really beautiful moment with one of my daughters, Amelia, age 10, did totally trick me. She was the assassin, and I was totally convinced She's a kid, I can I can see what she does. She's moving this one guy all the time. Come on. And actually, I guess she's becoming a young woman. Oh, she totally tricked me. The assassin came out of nowhere and inflicted uh, a wound. Uh, it wasn't enough to win, but I was impressed by the overall performance. And she was just so happy. Now, uh, the game can be a little bit anticlimactic. Maybe that's one of the problems that they have. Because it's a game with a certain architecture. It's a light game and a short game, but not a filler. It may take uh, 30 minutes to an hour to play. And when you play for 30, 40 minutes, and then the game is over because you miscalculated one square. You counted the squares and the assassin eh, can't quite make it by one square, or you're the king and you thought you were one square away from danger, and you're not. Having the entire game uh, decided by that minor miscalculation, that feels a little bit anticlimactic. That's something I'm okay with if it's a 5-10 minute filler. Uh, but here I see this adventure, this excitement, and oh, okay, it ended because of that. You can set it up and play it again, but it's just a little bit disappointing. Even winning that way is not as exciting. To me at least, my daughters never complain because of that. So as long as you don't mind about stabbing and about uh, uh, scheming and plotting in the dark, and maybe you don't like kings, and you say, or you don't like certain structures of power, and you see this as a metaphor to teach your children about uh, stabbing powerful people. I don't know what you teach your children, that's your business. But my point is that if the theme doesn't make you feel uncomfortable from the point of view of the complexity, it's a game that you can play with very young gamers, no problem. Heck, it doesn't even require reading, so um, no problem whatsoever to play with young gamers. Again, it'll, it's, all, it's all about how much stabbing your parenting style uh, allows. So, King and Assassins. It's a good, maybe not great game. Even with the two sides, you have replay value, but still, overall, there's a certain script that must play out from game to game. The bluffing element is interesting, but you really get to enjoy it only as the assassin party. It's fun. Uh, what can I say? I don't know if I'm gonna uh, gonna damn it with uh, lukewarm praise or lukewarm it with darn praise or praise it with look. I I I, don't, I never understood that expression. What I'm trying to say, it's a game that is good enough. It's good enough to play from time to time. Uh, to see my daughters all excited about trying to trick me, and sometimes really happy when they do trick me. Um, just maybe a little too formulaic and scripted and light to really work, I believe, at game night. Also, two-player games don't necessarily work very well at game night when you have game night with adult friends. 
not that I have any these days because in times of pandemic, but I'm thinking about the future. I don't think this game would really work all that well. A game night, because I can't play it as a quick filler while I'm waiting for more people to come. And I had to set it up and I prepare it. I play with my adult friends and I'm just, and we play for half an hour. And then again, it's about that one square that somebody overlooked. I don't know. It's good enough to play from time to time with my daughters. I don't think it's strong enough to really uh, have a present, a game night with adults. And this is my assessment of King and Assassins.